this meeting to order. Vice Chairman Roger Ratnam. Present. Commissioner Yates. Present. Commissioner Ferris. Here. Commissioner Dehan. Present. For present, we have a quorum. Well, please rise for Pledge of Allegiance. Mr. Warren, can you please lead us in the pledge, please? <laughs> To the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay, next item approval of agenda. Do I have a motion to approve the agenda? I so move. I'll second. Uh, Acting Chairman Rajaratnam? Aye. Commissioner Yates? Aye. Commissioner Ferris? Aye. Commissioner Dehan? Abstain. I was absent. Okay. Three ayes. Motion carries. Thank you. Approval of minutes of February 27, 2018. Do I have a motion to approve the minutes? I so move. I'll second. Roll call, please. Vice Aye. Chairman Rajaratnam? Aye. Commissioner Yates? Aye. Commissioner Ferris? Aye. Abstain. Commissioner Dehan? Abstain. <clears throat> Three ayes. Motion carries. Thank you. Time for public comment of agenda, of co public comments of items not on the agenda. Persons wishing to address the Commission on matters that are within the Commission's jurisdiction and do not already appear on the agenda may do so at this time. Pursuant to the Brown Act, the Planning Commission may not take action on an item that does not appear on this agenda. Speakers are limited to five minutes. The public comment section of the agenda is limited to a total of one hour. Each speaker is asked to provide his or her name. Uh, I open, now I open this to public comment at 6.03. Are you wanting to talk what's on the agenda? If it is regarding the assessment district, that is on the agenda, Mr. Warren. So you want to wait for Thank you, sir. Sorry about that. Any public comment? I don't see anybody rushing to the podium, so I'd like to close the public comment at 6.04. Discussion items. Lighting and landscaping maintenance districts. Staff presentation, please. Recent developments um, have shown that we have some cracks in our existing codes and ordinances. So we were, we were um, tasked with asking you for guidance on, on revising our lighting and landscaping um, maintenance district and our on-site detention requirements. So I'm actually going to have John Carlo and Lauren speak, speak more about those items. Good evening, Commissioners. Um, first item, which I'd like to uh, discuss, is the Lighting and Landscape Maintenance District, um, presently a requirement of our subdivision code, 19-2.3H. Um, um, so it essentially is requiring, as, um, as a condition of any sub subdivision prior to the recording, of a final map uh, that the developer enter into a lighting and landscape maintenance district so that the the costs prior to the property being put on the tax roll are um, are not shouldered by the city. Um, what we've found lately is that because it doesn't provide any language um, 
any mechanism by which um, the planning commission or, or anyone short of city council can uh, can provide some sort of leniency or um, exemption uh, on this requirement. And so we've attempted to draft language that which would both give the planning commission um, some discretion over the matter without making it so broad that we uh, end up uh, waiving it in places where it really would not be appropriate to do so. Um, so um, the, the carve out that I've uh, kind of proposed, this is just kind of a starting point for a discussion. By no means uh, are we expecting the final product to be this exactly, but um, it's it was sort of formed on the basis that any project, any development that would be small enough to warrant this would probably be a parcel map because if you're creating a, a large residential subdivision, it, it really does not seem appropriate to be um, letting the developers off the hook for um, lighting and landscape, other you know, improvements of this nature. And so the 350-foot um, frontage um, figure comes from the fact that about the largest space in you'll ever see um, any, rec any engineer recommend between street lights is about 400 feet. And again, we're trying to create reasonable exceptions, reasonable flexibility without um, granting so much latitude that years down the line, whatever the case may be, that we end up approving things that are, are substandard or, or end up creating um, an unnecessary burden on the city. And uh, we, we also felt that um, taking into account that they might have more than one frontage, um, so there's exceptions uh, that acknowledge that. And we also wanted to assert that if you have an unlighted intersection, that that really should be lighted uh, in any case, even if it is a small project. So I think that that um, would be a reasonable starting point to debate the merits of uh, of changing, making recommendations to, to council to change um, this particular Commission. section of the code. Do you have that, that language that's written? Because I, I don't see that. Uh, the suggested language or the Correct. present code language? S suggested. Uh, yes, I thought it was in our staff report. Is it in the, okay. Um, Discussion. Okay. Let me. I I changed the format of the staff report. I should have told you that. Got it. In the beginning. Okay. So it's now under discussion analysis. Okay. Got it. So any public comment? Mr. Chair, may I? Yeah. Um, there is uh, one other thing that might be considered, and it is the uh, number of improvements that might be associated with the project. Uh, what we're finding are that uh, some of these smaller projects, uh, for instance, the Warren Automotive Project, is a very simple parcel map and does have uh, some lighting, and they do have some landscaping. But we're finding that the cost of the actual uh, administration of these uh, lighting landscaping maintenance districts can be quite a burden on smaller projects. Um, in uh, consulting with our, our, our assessment district uh, engineer, our uh, professional, um, there is some point where it's not practical to uh, apply these lighting landscaping maintenance districts. Uh, for instance, uh, the Warren uh, parcel map only has two street lights. Uh, granted, they are at intersections, but uh, the cost for the uh, the administration of these lighting landscape maintenance districts is uh, is is fairly significant relative to the the benefit of just two street lights. Also, there's landscaping that the Warrens are doing along. Uh, 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 China Lake Boulevard, and uh, the uh, the uh, administration costs are very close to what the uh, maintenance costs are for the landscaping on that. So 
There is something that needs to be uh, uh, spoken to uh, regarding when it is practical on, on the size of a project that uh, isn't going to create a, a, a unnecessary burden or a problem for them. I've got another one that uh, I'm going to be talking about is uh, the Mather Brothers have a little infill subdivision. It's one of the um, phases of a of a map that's up in College Heights. It's an undeveloped portion. There's only 11 lots there. It's along uh, Norma, up in the College Heights area. It's uh, it's only got two street lights, and it's still saddled with the fact that it's along Norma, which is an arterial, which requires them to put in a, a perimeter block wall. It requires them to put in landscaping and an irrigation system. And it's the middle of nowhere. And yet the the cost for uh, establishing this uh, lighting landscaping district, the initial cost for establishing it is, is significant. And then the uh, and then when it's established, the uh, the administration costs and the maintenance costs are are quite a burden. So it, it, there's some point where uh, the city has to decide that uh, yeah, these smaller projects we're going to give them a pass. Or we say, no, you're going to have to carry some burden, or not at all. So uh, that, that is a factor that we're realizing here recently. This has just been recently, by the way, with the uh, current influx of uh, these developments that we're seeing right now. And in particular, some of the smaller ones, such as the Warrens and the Mather Brothers Project. And uh, uh, I can, let's see, I can think of... Uh, well, th those are the ones that. Uh, oh, uh, the uh, the uh, parcel map that you approved for uh, Dr. Uh, Mallory, another another good example. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the the provisions here are just uh, flat out straightforward. By golly, by gosh, by darn, you gotta you gotta enter into a, a maintenance district, and for so little that they're putting in there, it's going to be significant cost. So something has to be decided upon regarding the size of the project, when you're going to require the uh, maintenance district to be established or, uh, or give them a pass or decide on just how much they would have to have maintained within their development. So, Mr. Culp, when you say it is significant, do you have any approximate amount? Let's take, example, Warren's project. Well, yeah, I can. Uh, uh, you know, the uh, consultant has a considerable amount of work in putting these together. And so the initial cost is on the order of uh, $6,500. Now, it's been greater for larger projects because there's more to them. But uh, kind of a base price, uh, what he's uh, offered since there's been three of these, he's relaxed his fee. And each one of these three projects that we have currently are $6,500. Now staff has added an additional $1,000 to cover staff time in which we can charge our time against that, which is a refundable sum of those unused portions of money. But we had to cover our time as well. So you're looking at uh, somebody dishing out 7500 bucks just to get in the game. Then when you do have your uh, when you do have your benefits established and what your assessment is, it can it can be uh, a significant amount. It can, uh, and the point is here is that the administrative cost for administering these things can almost match the cost what it is for maintaining the doggone things. So uh, there's got to be some point where it's not a, a burden or a partial burden on the developer, or it uh, is con it's waived. I so go ahead. Are you sure? I'm sorry. Um, I have a few questions. So one would be um, the suggestions that I see here. It says it only applies to a subdivision with improved <coughs> parcel lands. It says any subsequent new construction or residential residential developments shall still be made to set up a maintenance district. So I'm wondering then, would new developments? So Dr. Mallory's was a separate issue at the last meeting because that was already as he had the property. He was just subdividing it. There was no new development. Now, would, this, would these suggestions still apply to a development such as Mr. Warren's, though, because his is a new development, and I don't see that covered in these suggestions? Well, the current uh, 
ordinance would require, does require Mr. Warren, the Warren subdivision, to comply and develop this maintenance uh, So district. even with these current suggestions we have uh, before us, it would not it, apply it, to it, him? I just want to make sure Yeah, I'm there would still clearly. be the potential, we'd still have the potential of having to satisfy uh, a few of these uh, exceptions. Uh, a couple of these exceptions probably would not apply. So uh, we would be in a position where uh, Mr. Warren only has two uh, street lights. He and and by the way, those are on an intersection, and uh, he does have uh, a perimeter uh, landscaping along China Lake. So uh, here you have a relatively small project, only two street lights, relatively small uh, landscaped area along the frontage, and yet your cost for initial uh, initialization is around seventy five hundred dollars, and your administrative costs. Are also are going to nearly match the cost for uh, maintaining the doggone thing, so. right? And that was something that the um, man representing Ms. Dr. Mallory at the last meeting had brought up and said, "Why don't we just ask him to pay for the lights rather than ask him to enter a district, <clears throat> which, like you says, has a hefty administrative fee?" So, what I also would like to understand is what is the the intention of this district. So I understand it if it's a large residence and you need to do maintenance on that mm -hmm. landscaping, but what would be the intention for everyone to do such a Well, uh, the, the uh, purpose of the maintenance districts are to uh, have the developed area be responsible for the costs for maintaining and for the uh, electric bills or any uh, bills associated with the street lighting. So the intent is, is for the development to pay for all those costs. Currently, the city has a, an a energy bill on the order of, gosh, it's over uh, a little over a quarter million dollars and plus and change just in, in lighting expenses for our street lights. So the intent is, is to try to implement the, the lighting landscape maintenance district so that the city's general fund isn't burdened by uh, having to pay for all the energy that the development uh, is enjoying. So then if the purpose is just to make the developer pay for the light, pay for the landscaping, why can't we just ask them to enter into contractual agreement to pay for that light and maintain it rather than go through the administrative fees to set up this, this district? Well, the, uh, I, this would just be uh, conjecture on my part. I, I think that uh, the uh, public right-of-way, first of all, it's within the public's right-of-way, these facilities. And uh, there may be some uh, liability issues for having a, a private owner maintaining uh, facilities out in the public right-of-way. And also some concerns whether there is a, uh, a long-term obligation for that a developer or those builders to uh, uh, continue to make payments on lighting bills and also for landscaping. So I think it's because it is within the public right away that it's uh, in the public's domain, whereby those costs are 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 are, are trying to be offset uh, from the city's uh, general fund to be offset or be paid for by those. Uh, right. I, I agree that it should be the developer who pays for those. What I'm not understanding still is, is there any other way around this to have the developer pay for it if other than have them go through this financial burden of setting up this district for such a small region? Like, it, why can't we just say pay for the lights? This is in your contract. I don't, or, um, or some kind of other agreement. I, 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 I am not aware of an instrument that okay. would, uh, facilitate that okay uh, I, I, this this is a instrument that's uh, uh, set up and approved by the state it's actually in the state constitution mm -hmm. it, and it is the uh, uh, 218 process and so uh, this is a uh, legally recognized method of funding the cost for public facilities is this what I, when I requested some information, I was sent something on the 1982 Act Benefit Assessment District. Is that this? That's a different. Uh, that's a different uh, the mechanism. Broader one. The, yeah, that's okay. uh, more for uh, uh, drainage 
uh, special benefit mm -hmm. assessment districts. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the uh, 1972 Seven. Lighting Landscaping Maintenance District. So it's, uh, it's in the uh, uh, state constitution. Okay. I think it was established in 1972. Because this one mentions street lighting, and I'm, I'm just trying to see what does the law actually mandate, and I have not gotten a clear answer on that then. I you wish I could, were more versed in it myself. I okay. must say that this is... Uh, you know, this thing's been in place. This was established by ordinance years ago. I think, uh, I think, seventy-five. I think, and why the city hadn't not implemented this, I don't know. Uh, the Horton tract up on the uh, College Heights was the first one in which mm -hmm. staff had imposed that, and that's really what kicked it off. Right. So this is very new to the city, to our staff. So we're feeling our way through this and seeing the pains and and the. Uh, inadequacies of, of the system. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. I, you know, we're, we're trying, to, yeah. trying to make it less burdensome. I think our public di works director, yes. would, would you like to come to the mic? This is a small group. Can I talk from here? Is that all right? Can everybody hear me all okay right? Sure. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm Bart Lauer, public works director. One of the, uh, one of the things that, that maybe appears as a slight misunderstanding is the developer pays to set up the district Developer pays for the first year of the district. You guys, correct me if I'm wrong. However, after that, and you're talking about the developer paying for the light in perpetuity. What the district does is is move that burden over to the individual lots or whatever within the district, so that that the people that have <coughs> lots within the district then pay for the light in perpetuity. So if we're talking about your your, your development. Four lots, right? Five lots. Eventually, that cost will be borne by your your repair place and whoever's in the other four lots, as opposed to the developer in general. So, I think just from listening to what you were saying, mm -hmm. it seemed like mm -hmm. maybe you thought that the developer was going to end up paying for this in perpetuity, and it's mm -hmm. not. Um, doesn't mean we can't talk about other possibilities for smaller ones maybe for bigger ones, a way of moving. What, what, what you have to do is move the burden from, the, you know, once the developer used to be, once the developer finished, then it became the city's burden to take care of. And the reason that the ordinance was written was to reverse that, to make it the burden of not the developer, but the burden of the taxpayers in the area that are benefiting from it. So what we may look at and I, I can't promise that there's any other thing out there, but it's not something I don't know if we've looked at it or not. But maybe other ways of moving it over, um, like maybe uh, I was thinking for the lighting and landscape district, maybe we could make it a fee um, or something like that. But something we could discuss and see what else is possible. But legally, we'd have to talk to the attorneys to find out what we could do besides this. But. Uh, for right now, they're at least looking at what we were noticing and talking about ways that maybe we can fix a few problems with the current system. Do you have any more questions? Did that help you with your question? It did. So, and so what they're paying for is the initial um, setup, and then after that, it will. You, you said they're not paying for it annually, but if other people buy those lots, they would. Just the first year. Just the first year. And then after that. It but what do you have in the case, though, where the developer is the owner and the sole one occupying that space? They continue to pay. Then they are. Okay, so I did under. They're not paying as a developer. They're paying as the taxpayer for that piece of property. Right. So I guess I, I understand it again. That makes sense for a large residence area. I just don't see the practicality and the benefit of it being for a sole owner where the developer is the owner and it's a one-lot business, kind of. Well, again, you have to look at the size. I'm agreeing with you, but I would think you would have to look at the size. Because if you look at Home Depot, that's a single owner, mm -hmm. but it's big enough that they should be taking care of that. Mm -hmm. Whereas, uh, we won't go into the middle one here, but, but the doctor from last time, mm -hmm. that, that was a, a, a large burden, and we all agreed on that. I mean, none of us argued. We just didn't see a way around it, um, as, as the city code is written. So, um, but so yes, I'm agreeing with you. But I'm just saying there are there are. I would say that you don't want to say all single owners don't. 
You have to have a more fine yeah, lingo it on it. Somewhere in the middle. Mm -hmm. yes. Any questions, Jessica? Not right now. Thank you. Okay. Sorry. Other wrong. commissioners. Yeah, just one. We're not. We're not making um, a definitive decision tonight, right? We just. This is just for discussion, and for us to come back to this. Correct. Correct. Okay. Because I have. Some. What we're asking is, we just start. What we're going to do is start going over the codes that are outdated to make them mm -hmm. more friendly to today's society, um, such as um, what is it? The thought just skipped my mind. Um, landscaping, perimeter landscaping, yeah. because we have the water efficiency ordinance by the water district. It doesn't really make sense for our codes to mandate that they landscape the perimeter when it's not friendly. So we're those are those are things that we need to work on down the road. Does it answer your question? It it does. Okay. And that's from what I understand that's part of our job too. Right. So we're just looking we for guidance on any ways that we could make adjustments to make us developer friendly and more up to date because the last time these codes were were um, looked at was maybe 20, 30 years ago and 20 would be very um, recent but I think these, these codes have not been changed for much longer than that. So I, I guess then my, my suggestion for research and I, if you send me reading material, I would love to read it um, on this matter is are there alternative mechanisms to fulfill the spirit of the law, so to speak, and that the developer and the owner of that lot is paying for it instead of the city footing that bill um, without having to go through, as I overheard at the last meeting, the, the onerous um, obligation to set up a maintenance district for a small area. Is there an alternative mechanism is what my question is. Yeah, we can certainly go to our consultant. Um, you know, this is a pretty specialized practice, this assessment district thing, and what, uh, how you can uh, put a tax burden on the uh, people that are uh, occupying that development. Uh, so, yeah, we can sure uh, find out if there's any alternatives, what the state constitution might allow. Thank you. Commissioner Fires, any questions? Um, I do have a couple of questions. My first question is, do we have any existing um, landscape maintenance districts, or is this the first one we are talking about? Uh, do we have any existing landscape districts? Y yes, yes, Commissioner, we do. Uh, we currently have uh, two, uh, two uh, that has been annexed that have, um, there are three separate zones for that. The very first one was the uh, Horton track, uh, track 6740 up on uh, College Heights. That was the very first uh, lighting landscaping maintenance district. Um, I apologize. We do have more than that. Um, okay. We have uh, uh, the surrounding tracks of the Horton project that have also annexed into lighting landscaping maintenance district there. Um, that, I think, is a zone two. Uh, we have the Walmart uh, uh, parcel map that has established or annexed into that uh, lighting landscaping maintenance district, and I think there are two separate zones there, two and three. Um, we also have a drainage uh, benefit assessment district for that uh, sump that you see off of uh, College Heights and uh, Springer. That's, uh, that's the very first uh, special uh, benefit assessment district that we have for uh, those those types of drainage f facilities. So we have uh, a, a two different uh, maintenance districts, one for lighting landscaping maintenance district and one for special benefit assessment district for the uh, for that drainage feature. So in case of DR Horton, is that developed land or? Uh, yeah, they, well even the undeveloped parcels are paying into the assessment district at, and a, we do at have a reduced lights. rate, at a reduced tax rate. But and do you have lights set up all over and we... The yeah, district. the only improvements are around the DR Horton tract, which are around the perimeter of Kendall 
and College Heights. That landscaping you see there along uh, Kendall and College Heights, mm -hmm. those costs are included within that uh, assessment district. Also, all the street lighting that you see for the uh, for that same tract of homes, those are all included within the lighting landscape maintenance district. All those homes, as well as those graded uh, lots, are also contributing to the special benefit assessment district for that uh, drainage feature at Springer and College Heights. So do we have any existing uh, landscape districts for, let's say, four or five parcels? If the land has four parcels, do we? Well, that would, be, that would be the Warren Automotive So uh, that would be the first map. one. That's, that, that's the, the first of the small uh, okay. projects that have been uh, proposed to the city that uh, we're realizing this, this burden on. So let's go back to residential land. Say there are 15 lots. Those lots are sold. So we cannot arbitrarily ask them to pay for the district, right? So they have to, there should be a public hearing and all those people have to vote to pay for that. Yes, it would have to go through uh, the 218 uh, process in order to have them uh, be annexed into uh, Lighting Landscaping Maintenance District if they're already recorded lots and uh, already separate owners. Or if there was a single developer that would agree to do that, we could uh, have him just, just cast his own ballot since he owns all of those lots. But uh, right now the uh, municipal code requires a, uh, a map, a subdivision, to first enter into a maintenance district prior to its recordation. So anything that's already been recorded, those uh, landowners for all of those lots would have to go through a 218 uh, hearing process and ballots cast and, and voting to uh, vote in that or deny that. Uh, so what will happen if they decide not to vote in to the district? So where do we stand? Well, if a, if a uh, development, uh, if they cast their ballot that they do not want to be in a lighting landscaping district, then it would be at the discretion of the council then to either deny the land division or waive the requirement or, or whatever. Uh, but if the ballot comes back no, well, then the... Uh, it's up to the, the, the uh, city council to decide what they want to do with that land division. Um, mm -hmm. So it's really, uh, you know, if you, if you have multiple homeowners, then uh, you count the ballots, and if the ballots come in uh, and by simple majority say yes, well, then the district is formed. Uh, if the uh, if the balloting if the uh, uh, balloting is such that uh, uh, that the majority is no, well, then it, it dies, and then it's up to the city to decide uh, if they want to try to pursue it again or not, or just let it die. Do you want to add anything to this, sir? Or okay. Oh, absolutely correct. So it seems like most of the examples. Maybe I'm wrong, but from what you were saying, it sounds like there are residential areas. We haven't really encountered it otherwise. Yes, uh, with the, this latest exception of the uh, of the Walmart being all commercial and uh, also the Warren Automotive being uh, mm -hmm. uh, commercial and uh, the uh, Dr. Mallory. Uh, mm -hmm. These are the commercial. most recent ones. Those are the are, most recent yes, ones. That's why we're running into most all of them are residential. residential. So I have one more question. So how do we assess the fee? What is the criteria? Is there a formula or how do we? The, um, well, the, uh, the fee for formation is dependent upon, uh, we, we rely heavily upon consultant services, the professionals for the specialized uh, service. So uh, the, uh, what we ask for is that, uh, that uh, professional or assessment engineer to First of all, give us what what is the cost for this so that we can collect that up front where the city is not uh, carrying that cost. We, we tell the developer then what it what that cost is for developing that uh, that maintenance district. The uh, developer pays that fee. The engineer proceeds with developing his his uh, his analysis 
of what the cost will be. He prepares his engineer's report. He prepares, prepares his staff reports and the resolutions all relative to his analysis and his engineer's report. Now the uh, tax burden itself, that's by a different formula. And that has to be, there are very specific methods of, of determining the benefits to each of those uh, parcels, each landowner. So, and that that's where the real science comes in. That's where the real specialized specialization is is necessary for determining so, yeah. that formula. That's what I was thinking. I mean, if my lot is, I have a light in front of my lot, I am getting more benefit. So, I should be taxed more versus a lot which doesn't have that much lighting from this district, right? Am yes. I correct in saying that? Uh, yeah. Uh, for instance, on the Walmart uh, project, there is a um, – it's, it's how far you might be away from those improvements determines what your benefits might be. Okay. Those that are closer to the street lighting, of course, have more benefit. Those that are more distant have a less benefit, and therefore their tax burden is much less or lesser, not, I shouldn't say much less, but okay. less than what the uh, primary uh, developer might enjoy. Good. Yeah, I'm sorry I'm asking these questions because I'm trying to understand those. So, you know. No, that's yeah, a really It, it has good to be point. proportional. The, the, the word there is it has to be a proportional benefit. Okay. So then that would make sense. What, what you're really paying for is that expertise if you have multiple owners and you need to understand who should be taxed more proportionately. It does not make sense then for a single owner is what I'm getting from this. The bulk of what you're paying for is that specialized expertise for that formula. That's actually, that's, that's correct. It's that uh, determining what that tax burden would be for uh, multiple owners and, and, and it has to be a, a proportional benefit. So then if we're talking about discussing suggestions, that would be my um, suggested improvement is maybe looking into and if we want an exemption policy or if we want a better way to fine tune this. It makes sense for multiple owners. It does not make sense to put a single owner through something like that, in my opinion. I, I, I would agree, yeah. And, and, and then, but it, you would have to, you would have to uh, temper that with, uh, you know, you could have a single owner that has a quite large development uh, that would have many street lights, that would have uh, many uh, 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 perimeter uh, landscaping requirements. So you would have to temper that on the on the like size in, of the like Walmart or Home Depot. size of the project and mm -hmm. the number mm -hmm. of improvements. But you're still just trying, at the end of the day, wanting them to pay for those lights, wanting them to pay for the landscaping and not the city. That's correct. Uh, the, the, we're trying to relieve the city of the burden of uh, the cost for those, of the maintenance of the landscaping and the maintenance or the, the energy bills for right. the street lighting. And I, and I just, I think, I would just imagine there'd be a way around that other than paying for the expertise of someone who has you know, we don't need if they're not subdividing this out to different owners. And well, right now the, uh, the uh, requirement is only for land divisions. So infill development, it's, it's not required. Um, so in, in theory, you could have a large development that has many streetlights as well as uh, many uh, large lineal footage of uh, landscaping that uh, our municipal code doesn't uh, require them to enter into a maintenance district. Uh, the, the requirement only falls on uh, land divisions. So if the owner is buying more than one lot, you're saying? If they did a land division, if they did a parcel map or a track map, is when the, our code requires the maintenance districts to be uh, uh, formed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, my only concern is I agree with Commissioner Hahn. I mean, are we sending a negative message to the developers by imposing these additional taxes on them? Or, I mean, we are looking for economic development. So is this going to come in our way of economic development? I'm sorry. Is this going to affect our economic development? We have yet to. Any other commissioner comments? 
Any public comments? Well, the, the biggest thing about this... Please was, state your name, sir. Oh, Rusty Warren, Warren's Automotive. Thank you. I'm new to this. <laughs> um, the biggest thing that side, you know, blindsided me was this... Uh, you know, I think in the beginning they did mention a maintenance and lighting district thing, but I didn't really pay that much attention to it because nobody really brought any funds or fees up or anything. But, but then when I got hit with it, like, I thought, wow. Because <laughs> you know, they're going to... We're, we're going to buy two street lights. And we're going to install two street lights. We, we're paying for this and hooking them up. Um, and then, then I don't understand. And they had landscape, which all the landscape is going to be behind the sidewalk. So any of the property owners will be dealing with the landscape. I don't see where there'd be a maintenance conflict with the city on that, except maybe a street, street sweeper down the curb. Um, I mean, you got abatement that'll take care of that. If the property owner doesn't take care of it, abatement will do it, you know. Uh, get on them about it. So I don't understand. That's the biggest thing is I don't understand this whole thing. And I've, I've learned a little more, and I appreciate you guys trying to work this to be a little more friendlier. That's, that's, that does need to be done. Um, I'm, not, I'm not, you know, saying we should stick the city with this. Um, I'd want to help the city. That's, that's what we do. We'd like to help. But... Um, and I don't mind incurring some cost, but you know, if I got to buy the light, install the light, and do all that, I might as well hook the light up to my grid and pay for the power. You know, it'd be cheaper in most cases. Um, that's an option. But yeah, and and if, if I if I correct me if I'm wrong, but when you do set up this assessment thing, that means each taxpayer gets something out of their taxes for that, right? I mean, is that how that goes? Collected through a percentage of the taxes, okay, for each owner, which is good. You know, that's that's a good thing to do, and I don't mind that at all. It's just that initial cost. I mean, there's a lot of initial costs on this thing that you get blindsided with all the time, and wow, <laughs> that's a good one. So yeah, if you guys could come up with a, you know, something that's a little more friendly, and uh, get things done, then that's. I'm for that. I mean, most most developments would be. Most people that are putting something up would be. But to get hit with that and then more, even that again in a year or whatever the case may be, that's a little rough. So it's it's got to be more friendly. And I, I'm kind of sorry I'm the guinea pig here. <laughs> but that's uh, I guess that's how we learn. <laughs> so that's all I'm saying. That's a big burden on people. And... and in other words, hey, I'll sell you some street lights for seventy five hundred bucks. <laughs> Simple as that, you know. But it's something that needs to be dealt with, and I hope you guys can come to a conclusion and make this workable for everybody. That's it. Thanks, Mr. Warren. I appreciate you. Um, any other public comment? I do have a couple of one question actually for the staff. Uh, I'm looking at the discussion and analysis, and it said provided one of the following sets of conditions are found to exist. So condition one or condition two, right? So two, you mentioned two conditions there? Yes, the second one having, you know, four um, subsets. So all four subsets have to be met to fulfill condition number two. Am I correct? That's the way that it's drafted, but this is really just a spur of discussion. Uh, this wasn't necessarily meant to be the final form that it would take, okay. but I was trying to um, lead it in a direction that would say, you know, we can't, it would, doesn't seem prudent to lift the requirement entirely. Here's some um, structure we could kind of work around to, that might provide reasonable exemptions without, um, you know, causing anything unreasonable um, to get signed off. So a subdivision of vacant land, so we are proposing, I mean, we are just discussing, I know. So in that case, we don't need to form a 
assessment district, right? What, that yeah, what that was specifically, and, and I apologize if it's not clear from the way that it was drafted, but that's specifically for where you have um, large, very large parcels and you're creating a parcel map that still results in large parcels that are, are not going to be developed immediately. So we're not talking about your 6,000 square foot residential lots, but we're talking about if, if the end result is you have three or four um, 10 or 20 acre parcels, then it, it doesn't seem uh, reasonable to expect the developer to enter a, into a maintenance district at that point in time. Okay. And the last paragraph under that discussion item, it said any subsequent new construction or residential development of the property in question shall be made subject to the requirement to provide for a maintenance district. So let's say the development is only two or three lots. So are we trying to say they have to form a district here or? Uh, again, that's the way that it does read and I think you sh we should um, craft a, a much more um, a targeted exemption there, but that that's how what that's what's presented to you. Yes. So, yeah. Thanks, Mr. Bruno. You're welcome. Any other questions? I think I'm guessing the direction, Mr. Faris, are you going to say something? Yeah. Oh, okay. The direction is. Probably I'm guessing that we should look more detail into this and come back with uh, some specific recommendations. Yes. Okay, ma'am. Yeah. So thank you very much, Mr. Kalp. Thanks, Mr. Bruno. And the... We have one more. We have one more. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, then the next item is the onset detention requirements, and this one is um, particularly troublesome to us because it's not actually incorporated into our city code, but it was adopted by resolution. So uh, one of the biggest problems is that often uh, when we get an application, the developer doesn't know until after they've drafted their plans and made their submission that, that there's any requirement to detain um, you know, runoff on site. Um, we, per uh, the uh, master drainage plan that was adopted by resolution in, back in 1989, um, most sites would be required to, main, to detain uh, runoff from a 10 year storm. And we think that naturally enough that that should be part of the city code itself uh, for clarity's sake and so the developers know what's required of them before they um, you know before they spend all the money on their soft costs they're, they're, they're um, getting their plans prepared and also that uh, if it's redevelopment of an existing property so for example if you're moving into a vacant building uh, and you're not incre doing anything that would cause an increase in runoff from from the present uh, then you should be exempted but, uh, and that, that's about um, the size of it, except for if you have a very large property, whether it is developed or not at present, if you're, if you're going to be um, redeveloping it, uh, then, then we should, and there's a persistent drainage problem that, that we can identify as, um, that property is making a significant contribution, then maybe you know the the exception shouldn't be offered there. But I think that's that's a good starting point for that discussion. Yeah, that that sounds reasonable to me. So, any commissioner comments? I have a question. Um, could you define for me what you mean by that the newly developed properties need to detain 100% of the runoff from a 10-year storm event? Um, I understand with detain, it's not always going to stay there. Eventually, it's going to go somewhere else versus retainment. There is a permanent pool of water. So I'm not sure what you mean by then 100% detain. Does that mean it's all of it's contained there for a certain amount of time? or That means that when, when you have... Uh, your 10-year storm event, which is, you know, it's just a statistical measure for um, 
how much water to anticipate. Exactly, how much rainfall you're getting. And 100% of whatever that figure is needs to be detained. So if, it's, if you have a 25-year storm, uh, you're, you're only required to detain the amount that you would expect in a 10-year storm, and the rest can run off into the street. The whole idea here is at the peak of the storm, uh, when there's the most water flowing through the city, we don't want it going directly into the street because that's when we experience um, the flooding. And L Lauren could probably elaborate that on, on it a bit more, but from you know uh, using layman's language, I think that's which I appreciate. Thanks. You're welcome. Okay. So basically, no runoff out of whatever the max vol volume is of that anticipated storm. No runoff. Okay. Any other commissioner comments? Go ahead, Mr. Carter. Um, may I, Mr. Chairman? Sure. Uh, yeah, the, uh, the idea is that we're trying to knock the peak off those instantaneous peaks whenever we have developed properties and create new rooftops and parking areas and, and paved areas. We uh, are immediately generating runoff, immediate runoff, and it's a peak, and it's, a, it's what we're trying to... Uh, keep from going out into the streets and complicating our already existing flooding problems that we have. The master plan had two options for the city council to consider. Uh, with the options were we let everybody build and they have the runoff to go out in the streets and we build these master plan massive uh, storm drains and channels and and uh, and so we allow development to go ahead and not do any kind of retention and we build, the city build and be responsible for these uh, large infrastructure uh, flood control facilities. Or the other option was, well, let's have people take care of their own drainage. Let's have them hold off on that peak. Let's have them uh, detain that peak and we can uh, maybe afford to build much smaller uh, storm drains and channels or uh, the, uh, the cost for those flood control facilities would be much less. And that's the option that the city council adopted to have uh, development do their uh, detention facilities and then the master plan facilities that were called for are, are much less in terms of cost and size and, and scope of, of work. So that's what, uh, that's what it's all about. And, and they, they only went to the 10-year event. So, you know, Katie, bar the door. If you get a 25-year event, you're still going to get a, you're still going to get flooded. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Thanks, Mr. Cobb. Any questions for the staff, commissioners? Nothing. Any public comment on um, on-site detention requirements? Mr. Warren, nothing. I'm glad if you worked it out, so thank you. I appreciate that. Any other stuff? Anything you want to add? So this is also a direction item, right? So you want us to look into this and come back later on? Is that what you are looking for, Mr. Burno? Yes, uh, I mean, if you think that this warrants um, a deeper dive, and you, you want to come back and revisit this at, at length, then um, I feel that would be appropriate because we are asking uh, that code changes uh, be suggested to the council. So, but right now we don't have any verbiage for the code change, right? Or do you want to incorporate the same thing for the code change? If you I not? understand you correctly, no, this, um, you know, I think what we're what remains to be decided is what what the language, what that form of that change is. I th I think uh, I get the sense that there's agreement that there needs to be a change of some sort, and uh, this was meant to kind of spur our uh, our thinking processes and, and kind of uh, and kind of provide as the basis for for uh, working that out. So, Commissioners, what do you suggest? Should we look into this and come back next time again? Or do you want 
the staff to come up with verbiage to change the code. I, I think it would be uh, wise for staff to come up with the verbiage for us to agree mm -hmm. on, and then from there we could send it to council for yeah. uh, the change of the municipal code. Does that uh, sound good? Because other than that, it, this would have to be hacked out in an ad hoc uh, committee. Uh, I have no objection to that, and I think on the question of uh, on-site detention, it's pretty straightforward. But if, if the commissioners have any um, suggestions for how they would change the proposal um, on the lighting and landscape maintenance districts that we presented them, uh, we will try and balance that with uh, the other concerns because I think the goal here is to to, to, cons to provide for every reasonable e exemption that there could be without letting projects that, that should be entered in these districts slip through the cracks. So we'll table the item for next meeting then. So then we'll decide. On the lands, landscape maintenance district, Mr. Kalp, you'll come back with some research on that, right? Yes, I oh. uh, believe to come back with whatever possible options there might exactly. be for funding. Yes. <coughs> Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Burna. Thanks, Mr. Kalp. Thank you. Thank you. And then we are moving to next item, commissioner items and comments, committee reports. Son. Do you have anything to report on the committees? Um, so for, I guess I'm the only one from infrastructure because uh, Mr. Cox is in here and unfortunately I was absent last week, but I was told that there was some more um, further discussion. We're still waiting to hear back about our, um, what we want to do with our water tank in the, um, um, the base. And so we're looking into other options for that still. Um, and also, I was told there was more discussion on the slurry sale machine. Is that correct? About the infrastructure? You weren't there either. Okay. Um, so I won't talk too much more on that then. Um, and then would you? Okay. Sure. And then I'll let him talk about the quality sure. of okay. life. Uh, quality of life had a workshop yesterday where we discussed the um, assessment for the Parks and Rec district and um, just got public input on on what that would entail and whether or not they would be in support of it mm -hmm. so that information will be um, sort of combined and then we'll discuss it at the next quality of life meeting so. thanks mm -hmm. I mean we didn't have a city or meeting so there is nothing for me to report so commissioner comments any comments you want to make uh, no, just that I'm really encouraged by tonight's meeting and that um, trying to find ways to take the law, make it current, but not let, you know, the bureaucracy of it uh, inhibit our citizens and the growth of the town. I'm really encouraged by that tonight. Thank you. I'll second that. Mr. Yates. I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, I just want to thank Mr. Kalp and Mr. Bruno for uh, bringing up these items for mm -hmm. our consideration. Really appreciate your research on that. Thank you so much. And thanks, Jessica, for being here. I appreciate that. And um, one request I have is, I mean, we always talk about economic development and uh, trying to be pro-business, pro-growth. So. My sincere request to staff is to work with our developers if there are some issues, try to work with them and make them understand instead of just saying, no, you can't do this. I mean, we need to tell them why we are, they are not able to do that, they cannot do that. So try to find some solutions. Uh, for example, um, the barn, they have some problems. So if you explain to them what their problem is, I believe the uh, city was trying to shut them down. I, I, I'm not sure whether that is correct or not, but that's what I heard. Okay, so 
just be, I mean, uh, polite and try to explain to them. I mean, we don't want to drive away, drive those people away from our town. So we want more growth, more development in our town. So that's my sincere request. Thank you. Staff items, future and past project status reports, Mr. Carl. Yeah, I can give you a quick rundown uh, on uh, current projects within uh, the engineering department. Uh, we currently have two uh, highway safety improvement uh, program projects. Uh, one is our four-way stop at our intersection of Bowman and, and Downs. Uh, we're about 30% into the design of that. We're going through our environmental compliance process through Caltrans on that. Uh, and we also have our uh, crosswalks, our school crosswalk projects that also uh, underway. That's uh, at a 30% design process as well. Again, there's an environmental uh, process to that too. So, And it's mostly mapping and uh, ensuring to Caltrans where equipment would be staged. Uh, uh, it just is mostly mapping to ensure that there's not going to be some environmental issue with uh, the project. There's, there's many, many things that uh, when the Federal Highway Administration puts out this grant money, there's a lot of a lot of boxes to check to make sure that we comply. So anyway, uh, approximately 30 percent on those. Uh, we're also uh, doing our, uh, our this this next phase of our sewer line replacement program, the and this is a line that is in uh, disrepair in uh, Bowman and Downs in that same intersection. We're trying to take care of that, of course, before we do our intersection improvements there, and we're about uh, thirty percent complete on that design as well. Uh, and uh, we also have uh, uh, two. Uh, CMAC, this is, this is called uh, Congestion Mitigation Air Quality Grants. Uh, our signal synchronization project is uh, very near, nearly complete. All the uh, instrumentation is installed. All the equipment has been installed. Uh, we're working on the uh, software and training whereby we'll be able to uh, uh, work on our uh, traffic signals and synchronize them from a workstation within City Hall. So mm -hmm. uh, we're very near completion on that. And I'm very excited about that, to be able to synchronize our intersections uh, signals. That'd be from uh, College Heights through uh, California, all those traffic signals. Oh. What is the project range. cost on that? Uh, the project cost? Uh, the total project cost, I believe, was, um, boy, I, boy I, you know, I just don't have that at the tip it's of my tongue. I just curious, so that's I, fine. I wish I, 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 I really wasn't as quite prepared as I should be for this presentation. I can have that for you next uh, next meeting, however, but Does we are very close to completion on that. Does that just include uh, China Lake Boulevard? Yes, it is just China Lake Boulevard, uh, College Heights, uh, Bowman, uh, Raider, uh, Up John, uh, Church, and California Signals. Okay. <clears throat> Our bus transfer station out in Inukern, where uh, we have taken delivery on the bus shelter out there, uh, so we're uh, moving along uh, and then trying to complete the improvements to that hub station. Our senior center parking lot, uh, we've got the plans completed. We're preparing the bid documents for that now. Uh, I anticipate being out to bid by the end of the month, end of April, uh, being out to bid. So we should have construction uh, early June, let's say, and that will be uh, a prime uh, paving season. So we'll, we'll, we will be in a good uh, time period for uh, redoing that senior center parking lot. The senior center CDBG uh, project, the community development block grant, uh, we have uh, the plans are completed, the specifications are completed. We're now waiting for the county to approve what's called a Schedule A, which is the uh, contract for the uh, for the uh, funding. Uh, that goes to their county council. They approve that, and then it uh, comes back to us for our execution. And at that time, we'll have authorization to go out to bid on that. So we should see construction activities on the senior center uh, this summer as well. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, of course, we've been working on our lighting, landscape, and maintenance districts. 
we have our uh, what's called our Regional Surface Transportation Program (RSTP) grant, and that's for the east side of uh, Downs between Ridgecrest Boulevard and uh, and Upjohn. Um, uh, the design is essentially complete, and the bidding documents are essentially complete. Uh, the uh, we've had some uh, a special environmental study that was required that's uh, kind of kept us from uh, being able to get our authorization for construction money. But uh, we had to do a architectural review on uh, the Mather Brothers building. It was built uh, over 50 years ago. And again, one of those environmental check boxes uh, for federal money is that if you got any architectural structures that are over 50 years, automatically kicks in an architectural review of any significance to that to that structure. So, and that's that's taken quite a bit of time. So, uh, we're completing that environmental process, and so uh, hopefully we're going to get underway here with an authorization to proceed with construction. Uh, we've also got a grant out for the uh, west side of uh, Downs, and uh, we've, uh, we're uh, working with uh, Southern California Edison and uh, getting easements for the poles to be relocated. Uh, we've paid for the design. We've paid for the relocation of those poles, and, uh, and we've uh, prepared all the uh, documents, the easement documents, the exhibits, and now we're ready to present those to the landowners to have them uh, sign the easements for the pole relocations, and once that's underway, then uh, and we are successful in obtaining the RSTP grant for the west side, we're going to be in a pretty good position to launch that project. So, any idea when that will be? Well, if we can acquire, I, I just got an email from Edison wanting to know what the status is of the easements, and I've uh, indicated to him that we've we've completed everything to the form and to the letter that Southern California Edison's want for their easements uh, very specific requirements there so we've accomplished that now uh, and I've told them that I think I can get uh, those landowners within a 60 day period to uh, get things signed and into the the city and and into rather into uh, Southern California Edison's hands for them to be recorded and uh, they tell me that they're ready to go. They're trying to plan their summer season yeah. for work. And they're, uh, 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 from what I understand, if we give them the go-ahead, they're ready to mobilize. They've already purchased the materials. And uh, it's, uh, the plans have been completed. So they're ready to go. They're waiting on us to get the signed easements, is what it amounts to. So once that's underway, the poles are out of the way. And we get our RSTP funds. Well. Uh, we're 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 going to be uh, improving that roadway. So, uh, let's see, uh, well, our SB one streets. We're uh, putting together our list of streets that we're going to report in May. We've got our May deadline for the streets that we're, we have we're required to report to uh, to uh, uh, to the uh, California Transportation Commission, and we just met today uh, as to what we're going to report on them. Um, Bart is taking the lead on that, him and Les, and uh, I'm uh, kind of riding along there. But uh, uh, anyway, the SB1 requirements are coming up in May, and we're in a good position there. We're also working with uh, Rite Aid with their real estate agent to get the uh, uh, right away for uh, that little uh, light pole that's on that uh, little narrow sidewalk there along Rite Aid. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we, we, uh, when we were doing Ridgecrest Boulevard, we discovered that the, all the right of way wasn't there. The right of way line fell along the face of the curb, and so uh, the sidewalk doesn't fall within our right of way. So we're we're uh, discussing uh, obtaining additional easement for the sidewalk and being able to put a walk around that little light pole there. So. Um, Gosh, that's just uh, that's just what I have here for. Oh, uh, well, we're putting together our paving season also. Uh, Bart has got a uh, pretty good handle on where he wants to uh, put our resources for our paving season, so we'll be launching that here uh, also. So um, that's about all I can think of. Bart, is there anything I might have missed there? Uh, yeah, I think. Well, that's uh, that's kind of a thumbnail sketch where we're at, and if you. Have questions on uh, 
you know, project costs or estimates and so forth. I'll try to be better prepared next time. I just no, give you a is, thumbnail. <coughs> that's fine. I was just there. curious. I mean, you know, so other than it. So can you give? Go ahead. Yeah, that's right. that you do that fine. Yeah. Yeah. Is that acceptable? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Right? That's acceptable, right? Okay, I'm talking for my. <laughs> um, Mr. Kalp, can you just give updates on existing constructions like DART building? Where do we stand on that? Uh, yeah, the uh, DART building, from what I understand, um, the county has done their final inspection and uh, it's. Uh, They've uh, approached uh, the city for a certificate of occupancy. Uh, we went out and did our uh, site review, and uh, the, uh, the conditions of approval required them to bring their driveway approaches to uh, ADA uh, standard, and, and that had not been completed. Oh, okay. And so uh, I think we were in a position to issue a, a temporary conditional uh, yeah. occupancy permit which uh, gives them the opportunity to go ahead and operate, but uh, also to uh, uh, a commitment to finish up those improvements to the street. That okay. allows them to get those completed, and then we can issue the, uh, the uh, permanent uh, certificate of occupancy. Okay. So, and uh, the barn project, uh, uh, they were, uh, I believe there was some issues with uh, some electrical work that was, had not been finalized on the pumps uh, that the county had not uh, fully approved. Um, the, uh, the the contractor did come to me to have me look at the offsite improvements, and uh, what I did find is that they're they're trenching across Triangle Drive. They had not completed the permanent patch or the permanent trench mm -hmm. restoration. Uh, for the gas line trench, as well as for the new service that uh, the water district had put in. And there's uh, just some very rough uh, finish uh, uh, asphalt work that had to be done with the, with the curb and gutter that they uh, had to replace where the new water service came in. They uh, also had the truncated domes for the ADA compliance in the wrong location, and they had to relocate that. But... Uh, I believe they satisfied all of Caltrans requirements. Uh, they painted the curb red as required. I believe they have taken care of their uh, dedication requirements. And again, there wasn't sufficient uh, right-of-way there. The right-of-way line fell along the curb face, and they did dedicate additional right-of-way, 10 foot of additional right-of-way. So I believe they satisfied everything from Caltrans, and it's looking like the only thing that uh, Public Works has is the uh, trench restorations for the water and the gas line and the relocation of the truncated domes. They're but again, I think yeah. we were in a position to issue a temporary conditional occupancy permit. Yes. Uh, and uh, so uh, I believe they posted a bond to secure that they would proceed with taking care of the trench and the truncated domes and so forth. So they're operating and uh, well, and we are secured in having a bond to ensure that they'll complete the, the improvements to the roadway and the truncated domes. Yeah, that's it. So I don't think anything else is going on. Pizza Hut is completed. Starbucks is completed. So everything is... We, we still have a little work on the driveway at Starbucks. And oh, we've, okay. I've been in touch with Starbucks, and they're thinking about widening that uh, driveway out. Oh, okay. I have a place to call with the pastor to see if he would be responsible for the matchup paving, and uh, he hasn't returned my call yet, but uh, he has indicated that he would go to the elders to see if they'd fund the uh, paving, and in the event they don't, well, we're in a position where we might be able to throw some uh, temporary asphalt in there until the church or whatever we decide for the paving to... Is that on the uh, ward? On the ward, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the driveway on the ward. Uh, uh, we're uh, asking them to widen that out, and uh, and Starbucks talking to them. They want to. Uh, I, I talked to them uh, this weekend, as a matter of fact. Caught the regional manager, and 
and they're thinking of widening it out even more so than what we thought uh, would be necessary. They're thinking of taking it out to the full 44 foot width that was there before. So uh, we're, we're okay with that. If the pastor will have the church then do the backup paving for that additional widening, well, we're, we're in pretty good shape. So that's moving along. That's good. Yeah, it looks nice. I mean, it's always busy. So yeah, they're doing yeah. good business there. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't think of any other constructions going on. Do you want to add anything, Ms. Panpradit? We are now in um, doing property negotiations with Hobbs and Carr for Lot 15, and then we have work to do for splitting up the baseball fields, which was an oversight on my part. Um, so we need to have a legal description and another map recorded on that. And, go through that process for the ball fields, but we're ready to move forward with Lot 15. And then Red Rock Villas, um, our planning consultant said it should be about another 60 to 90 days until he's all done with the, the paperwork for all of that. So you'll be hearing the general plan amendment and the zone change within the next couple months. Thank you. That's good. So anything else to add? If nothing is there, then I'll adjourn the meeting at uh, 7.16.